Nick Fryer, thanks so much for coming in. Absolutely. All right, for those who haven't been paying a whole lot of attention to what's going on in Fort Myers and the Red Sox, Keep them up to date. What is the biggest thing they need to know about right now? Well, right now they don't have that closer unless they're going to go with Ryan Brazier or Matt Barnes. And they're also think, looking strictly at Stephen Wright as a relief pitcher right mm. now, which makes sense in terms of the starting rotation. But is he going to be your answer in the back end of the bullpen? Is he going to be that eighth inning guy? Normally, I don't trust knuckleballers. But one thing, and I know Eckersley's, Dennis Eckersley has said it before, when Wright is healthy, he's, he's just as good as anybody. So as he's long good. as he's you know healthy and taken care of, and it's usually his knee, not his arm. Wakefield did some bullpen stuff. Back yeah, in the day, but, but Stephen Wright's Stephen Wright's different because he has that fastball, fastball. that he can kind of use. All right, let's play a game here. Starters: Sale, Price, Porcello, Ovaldi, Erod. I want win projections for all of these players. Okay, I would say for Sale it's going to be 17. For Price it's going to be 16. For Erod it'll be 12. For Porcello it will be 13. And who am I missing? Ovaldi. Ovaldi. Ooh, I'm going to say Ovaldi's going to be 11. 11. Yeah, they're all going to be double digits. Porcello has this good year, bad year routine. Mm -hmm. Is he going to be good this year? Yeah, I, I don't see why not. I think that these guys have a little bit of a weight off their shoulders now, and I, and I think Porcello has to go improve himself to some extent too. So a combination of that where I've won, but at the same time I need to go and prove that I deserve you know, big money. Is, you know, that's what he's got going right now. All right, the two studs for the Red Sox last year, Mookie Betts, MVP, J.D. Martinez, also mm -hmm. in the conversation. Who is more likely to have as gaudy of numbers as they did in 2019 as they did in 2018? See, I would say Mookie normally, but J.D. Martinez just said how he was dealing with an oblique strain uh, in the second half of the season when his numbers kind of dipped a little bit. So he was playing hurt, <laughs> and he still put up those numbers. I would say if he can you know, stay healthy the whole year, which you know, obviously guys get banged up no matter what throughout the year, but if he can stay relatively healthy, then... I would assume he's going to have better numbers, maybe even than last year. All right, in light of all these big-name baseball players on the street not being signed, Bryce Harper, mm -hmm. Manny Machado, there's a whole lot of discussion with players about contracts and when their deals are up uh, and hitting free agency. Uh, with that as a backdrop, Mookie Betts, Xander Bogarts both coming up here in a couple of years. What serves them best and what serves the team best as when today agree to long-term deals? I think for the Red Sox, no matter what, is try and get them both locked up as soon as you can, assuming you still want to invest in Bogarts. But the thing is that these guys are kind of approaching it like they're in the NBA or like the days of old when everybody was getting those 10-year contracts. You're not getting 10-year contracts. NBA guys don't get 10-year contracts. They get five and get paid a ton. But it's a player-driven league, whereas right. Major League Baseball is all about the teams. So that's kind of what you're running into right now, and that's why you're not seeing Machado or or, or um, Harper, Harper sign any or, or Kimbrel for that matter too. They're valuing themselves fine, but you're not going to get that over an extended period of time. So whatever Harper and Machado get, we should assume Betts will get that or more in a year or two. I would assume it's going to be something similar, more similar. so, not not too much more if at all. All right, uh, I want to talk about the Red Sox uh, shakeup. Wei, uh, oh. Joe Castiglione is back, but there's a uh, an array of other co-hosts, including Sean McDonough, Chris mm -hmm. Berman. Yep. Uh, Lou Merloni, a lot of guys. What do you make about the WEI I radio think, call this year? I think that their approach is is different. Uh, for sure, they've talked about trying to make it more like a talk show, which I can understand that. But you have certain guys in there who I don't know if that's going to mesh and, and gel as much. I think Lou can absolutely do that. Right. Obviously, he has his show. And Dale can, too, but he likes to go and do his own thing, where it's he's more of a typical broadcaster whenever he's been on the broadcast this past year. So I don't know how effective it's going to be in having a bunch of different guys. Guys, it's like they're almost trying to be what the morning show used to be. I, I don't oh, see how a it can be. Casting couch of yeah, sorts. it's going to be. I don't know how effective it can be. All this right, year, at least. We're switching gears to the Celtics. Obviously, the All Star game tonight. Looking ahead to the second half, which is really the last third of the season. What needs to change for the Celtics to be consistently good? I don't think. I think that part of the problem, the biggest problem they have is too many mouths to feed. And I know it's, it's old and it's tired, but I think that that's true. After seeing what Jalen Brown does, looking at his numbers more in depth, I wrote about it earlier this week, Yanni, for Celtics Wire, that he's, he's trying to get his shots a little bit too often. In, in the course of the offense, you know, Kyrie should be getting more shots, Jason Tatum as well. And then Morris has been their third best guy this year. He's trying to do a little bit too much, whereas Rozier, we always think, oh, he, you know, he's a problem, he's part of the issue. Right. He defers a lot. So I think... They have to figure out how to keep Jalen happy to some extent. And I think they're getting there, but when, when Kyrie's out on the floor, that's where you kind of lose some of those shots for everybody, and that's where he starts to press a little bit more than everybody else. 
the locker room stuff that Marcus Morris alluded to about a week ago, is that going to be behind them? Are they all going to be on the same uh, unit here moving forward? I can't, I can't imagine that it's not going to pop up again because it seems like with every loss that they experience, or a, at least multiple losses, that's where they, that this starts to kind of pop up. Mm. And then it, it seems like winning just kind of cures all. But Kevin Garnett said in an interview earlier this week, he this kind of stuff happened with us. Maybe right. not the same exact thing, but it happened back in 08. So... I don't understand why we, people forget that. I know it's right. been what over ten years now since that happened. But at some point, it's you know you got to realize that these all these guys are pretty much the same thing. Right. It is a diva league. It's how it is. All right, Milwaukee and Toronto may be tough to catch. Ultimately, where do the Celtics land in the playoff seedings? I, I would be stunned if they're anything lower than four. I know the Pacers have been able to stay afloat since Oladipo got hurt, but I would think the Celtics are going to pass them up. And I think they're going to pass up. You know, I don't think the Sixers are going to be ahead of them at the end of the race either. I think Toronto is a little bit insurmountable right now as well as the Celtics have done against them in the Bucks are they're cruising so I would say they're gonna end up at third third okay 